All right, how are the levels? We'll drop the music a bit. Right, we are going to be doing at least some of this live. Gonna try to figure out some OBS wizardry. I need to learn OBS a little bit better. Instead, what's up Dev, how you doing tonight? Finally, an EST friendly stream. Yeah, I, we were going to do this a bit later too, but I actually moved it up because I wanted us to be a little more EST friendly. Although, waiting to hear from Tomo currently, so um, we will get him in here once he's ready. Ooh, nice. Wife's been doing work on some graphics for the stream. My OBS is such a mess though, I swear. All right. <clears throat> Stream starting soon graphic there. Nifty. It's not bad as a backdrop either, to be honest. Okay. That might look weird in the overlay. So then the overlay that she made, which is pretty rad. Hey, I'm in the wrong spot, but... <laughs> Okay, wait. There we go. Yeah, I think this works. I think this works well. Quite well. Nice. Dude, did you clip when I was talking about the architecture bit on stream? I want to go back and clip that. I feel like I, I kind of... I don't know. I want to see what Theo thinks of that, because I kind of burned their uh, focus on it. It's not really the architectural bit that I was doing, though. I was more memeing on it. Um, yeah, that was fun. That was a good, uh, good idea to look at that architecture. So are you going to do like a full uh, breakdown, like a technical analysis of the Twitter architecture? Wait, 
that's what I was gonna do. Yeah, it looks funny with a double background for sure. All right. There we go. Oh, goodness. Oof. We're doing it live, people. Oh man, I'm such a pixel perfectionist too, this is gonna bother me. Oof. Close enough, we'll call that a win. All right, how's everybody doing tonight? Memeing on what? Uh, it was when Elon Musk tweeted about Twitter's architecture and they had he had like box drawings on the, like a whole whiteboard drawing and I pulled it up on stream and we like tried to trace through it and follow it and kind of I, I ranted about it for a little bit. It was fun. It was good times. Um, how you so see? I like looking at that. Yeah, I did more of a like psychological meta analysis on what that exercise must have looked like for them. Mine was more like, well, look at the fact that they put you know the ad top and center or front and center, and they put the you know driving ads at the top of their bullet points for the list of values like i was more chuckling about the fact that it was clearly a very elon vision driven diagram You don't think it was an Elon driven thing? No, I mean. The diagram was made in was verse. Even from that perspective, it was uh that's not what I got out of it. The way the way this stuff was labeled to me, it just seemed so much more focused on ingestion. I didn't even understand how it was querying data, but I don't know, I could have misread the whole thing. And I wasn't saying that like Elon defined the architecture so much as like the people creating it were creating it based on what he wanted to see and, and like his bias or the bias of what they think he would want to see is what I thought was. Oh, hold on. All righty. Um, I did ping Tomo. I haven't heard from him yet, so I'm hoping he didn't fall asleep early or something. Um, next gen architecture diagram didn't even mention ads. I mean, yeah, all the stuff that it eventually pointed to. Well, there was one bit that I think did. On the right side, they had another ad service. But again, like some of it was so vague, it was just like, we can't, like, I don't really know how to interpret this like the whole mixer timeline mixer in the middle i was like there's some heuristics going on here this is some reference to like stuff they have on their pipeline i don't really get it you know so i could only say so much on it <clears throat> so i'm hoping around the time well, one, I'm hoping Tomo logs on soon, replies. Um, but then I'm thinking we will probably run an ad break so we get pre-roll knocked off for a long time. So we'll take a quick break. Tomo and I will hop in. If you're a sub, you can watch us do audio check, basically. We'll probably hop in and do audio check and make sure that I can get my scene set up, make sure the embed's working nice. And then, uh, yeah, and then we'll get into it. 
So it'll be like a two minute ad break and then straight into it. I'm thinking probably like 30, 40 minutes on the coffee chat. And then I'm going to leave some time for Tomo to ask questions specifically. And then I'm going to have some time for um, questions from chat. So I just realized I should bring something up. Ah, looks like we got him. Here we go. I hear you. I can hear you. Fantastic. Now let me get this embed set up. Add this. Yo, yo, yo. Move this. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you. I'm doing a mic check on my end. All right. I'm, I'm just re I'm recording as well because, you know. Yeah. Record it, brother. All right. Look at, is this uh, styled with Tailwind? Um, no. <laughs> I love that that's the thought, though. His, uh, his site's not styled with Tailwind? Which site? Oh, ping, ping is yes. Ping absolutely is styled with Tailwind. <laughs> I thought you were talking. I'm looking at my OBS right now. I thought you were talking about my overlay. Um, oh no, I'm just looking at this ping.gg slash call slash Nate. Yes, yeah. Oh, I should have had my wife put a ping.gg logo somewhere on this overlay. That is something that Theo would have appreciated. Dang it! It's not too late. Um. Well, she's putting the kid down, so it's a little too late now. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. No, I mean, you, you, I mean, you could do it. I could definitely do it. Hmm. Hey, there you are. Let's go. All right, that's better. Okay, so now we have you on stream. And there we just, go. That's uh, nice. <laughs> looking good. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool. Well, thank you, everybody, oh, for joining us tonight. I don't see you, though, by the way. Um, like You... On, on this screen. Yeah. I think I could do it with the virtual cam. I turned off my video initially because I'm using it for my OBS. Oh, I see. That's fine. That doesn't matter. But this would actually be a nice way. And internal. All right. So now you should be able to see the stream oh, there we go. on ping. So this gives you a feel for what we're seeing on screen. Check in on Twitch chat really quick. Oh no, did I accidentally? Oh gosh. It syncs up really good too. Alright. Well, let's hope that's good. 
All right, we got Tig sit in chat. Said hey to Tomo. Very cool. Tig, what's up? I think. Uh, oh, I'm definitely gonna cut my music. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> we got. I believe audio you levels are good. Yelling me. I don't have coffee. Actually, I don't have coffee. You or... said it's coffee chat. <laughs> I'm so unprepared. I'm unprepared for my own coffee, coffee chat. chat. <laughs> I'm having coffee at 10 p.m. It's fine. Well, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your tonight. dedication. Um, <laughs> so, coffee chat. I've I've heard used as a term that I always took to mean a potentially shorter chat. Right? It's more of a casual, typically mentorship style chats. Um, uh oh. I. It's been a busy day. We had a, a family birthday party and stuff. So I should have brewed coffee. I really should have. And maybe I'll get a caffeinated beverage here. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that you showed up. That shirt is fantastic. No. That is awesome. My friend Safety Mouse got me this as a gift. That is so cool. Oh man, <laughs> the I love father. it. father, she made it so, like on a print on demand service. <laughs> so I found, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, actually, I was going to run a quick two minute ad break. Um, that will knock off the pre-roll. So anybody who stops but, by won't get ads for like 30 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna get that started. To do a... If you're get hit with these ads i'm very sorry we'll start with a self-deprecatory story about myself um so if you want to catch that you can sub real quick but uh no yeah we, we just want to do that so anybody who's browsing anybody who stops by the channel they don't all get hit with that 30 60 second ad break on entering meanwhile the we'll align our chakras so, yeah meanwhile we're gonna get all in tune hit, give a you know two minutes of behind the scenes here so all right we'll kick that off right now um Let's do well, it. I shave for you. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, I was going to say, you look a little different than the last time we spoke. Very, very professional, very clean shaven. Um, so I was going to talk about my my faux pas of uh, tweeting a picture of Tomo without asking his permission. And I, I thought oh, this I was great. I don't actually care. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I it's mean, funny because... I, mean, I, would, I wouldn't have posed that picture, but it doesn't actually bother me. <laughs> well, no, no. I, I stopped, want to give you the background on being, it, though. I, I stopped being vain the day hair started growing out of my ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel that. Yeah, there's a lot of humility you get later in life when it comes to how you look. <laughs> no, but it was funny because I, I love that picture. So I found it before. This is just on his Wikipedia page, right? So I go to Wikipedia for Tomo to read up on his accomplishments and accolades and uh, I find this photo and what I love about it is he's wearing a shirt that says I quite like music and so my <laughs> idea and what I wanted to do I'm going to break out Photoshop at some point and take a crack at this but I think it would be awesome to take that photo and Photoshop code for music so it says I quite like code I just thought oh, that yeah, would be no, a that's great. great that's a great shirt to steal too the yeah, story behind no. that shirt is actually uh, that photo was taken in London I believe and I borrowed that shirt from the person who produced our album. This is, uh, yeah, this is War, a guy named Flood. I, uh, I, I didn't have a shirt for the show. We just flew in, and he let me borrow that shirt. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah, that was a I long time it. ago. That was like two thousand nine. <laughs> yeah, no. So let's uh, let's just start there. Actually, I had a couple questions. I want to talk to you a bit about just initially your background. Um, so more in music, but even before that. So my first question for you, um, well, actually, let's just see before I fully jump in. We got 26 seconds on on the uh, ad break there, so I won't jump right in. But um, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think one, that shirt is awesome. And I want to like actually, I mean, I don't know, I'd have to look into copyright stuff, but make a version of that with I quite like code because I just think that's a great. I'm shirt. pretty a sure there's no copyright to that. Too. Yeah, I think that's it's, it's a that pretty straightforward him. design. But yeah, the um, I I have a lot of shirts that are just like typography elements. You know, they're just uh, I have one shirt that just says "Do hard things." I have a shirt that says "Life is beautiful." Like I've always liked just fun typographic statements and a uh, simple graphic tee. So, all right. Um, so the ad, the ad is done. So we got pre roll off for thirty minutes. So we can jump right into it now. So, um, yeah, first jump of all, jump right in, brother. <laughs> Tomo, if you want to just introduce yourself and, you know, who are you and specifically, um, you know, the things that people know you for, but then also what you're currently doing. So sort of current year snapshot on uh, just a yeah, high level intro, 30 seconds or so. I am Tomo, fellow human. 
um yeah a uh, formerly musician i mean that that past is honestly like for me not that interesting it's such a long time ago now uh you, you could look it up formerly guitarist of 30 seconds to mars but uh in the last year very seriously starting to undertake software development i guess focusing on web dev right now because that was the first path that i took but honestly i don't know where it's going to lead that's just what i'm focusing on really hard right now and doing an online course like many people do and you know just kind of working connections and trying to mingle with people and you know steal as much knowledge as i can from anyone who's willing to give it to me as we do you know uh but yeah just studying and more or less have become obsessed with this world in my retirement as a musician um it's basically the best way to put it during the pandemic if you want to know exactly how it started during the pandemic mm -hmm. a good a good friend of mine who is uh in the in the coding world but on the cybersecurity side just recommended to me i was really bored like many people were during that time and he was like dude go do an online coding tutorial it's, it's super hard it'll it'll be fun for you it's challenging you know it'll it'll fill your time and and he was right <laughs> and that was that was a hobby you know what i'm saying and, and right. i was doing it like a hobby i wasn't taking it very seriously it was fun it was cool i was doing it in between making music for fun and playing video games and just doing other you know just like occupying time during lockdown you know and uh but then at the end of 2021 i started to do the the tutorial shit more more regularly more and i was like getting into stuff that was like a little bit more um uh, I'll, uh maybe a little bit i saw your messages now but uh starting to get into it a little bit more like more complicated stuff and like trying to actually do it you know what i mean and then in february of this year i was like okay this is starting to get pretty crazy like i wonder if i was to focus all of my attention on this and treat it like a full-time job like a 50 60 hour a week job and i like my job is to study this and to structure my days and my weeks as if i'm you know a student in university trying to learn how to do something you know <laughs> not that i know how to do that because i didn't go to school but to the best of my ability of how i would structure my days to just learn and practice and apply right yeah i love and now here we are so it's like uh you you just you just asked me a, a text on the side you were like is it okay to talk about the new thing i, yeah. I wouldn't call it a, i wouldn't call it an employer um it's an opportunity that came through the same friend by the way that i initially was talking about uh the cybersecurity guy he went to hawaii and met with some people and they're rebuilding their company i'm not going to talk about what it is because i don't know if i have the, the the right to do that but they're rebuilding their company it's a very small team it's a service it's a product that actually exists and people use right now um but they're changing it from angular to react and so he was at a dinner with them and brought me up and was like hey do you want to let this person tag along they're looking for real world experience that's so rad. And I'm, and, and I'm about to finish the front end course of Code Academy. I'm literally on the very last section, which is just learning about like Redux and some and some of the, the topics surrounding that. And and I know a lot of people are probably like, don't use Redux or whatever, but you know, that's what they're teaching us. So that's what I'm going to learn. Uh, and then the very last project for the front end course is to build a Reddit client just completely on our own. So I thought to myself, like, everything in code academy is really cool and it's and i and i definitely feel like i'm learning but i've been around long enough to know that the real world just simply can is just never going to be what an online course can show you like that's just always going to be so much more involved and so much more just like deep you know <laughs> even a simple thing is just going to be so much more uh you know technical and professional because it has to work properly you know, especially if you're like taking payment from people or storing personal information and stuff like that. So I really wanted to work on real code, but I'm sitting here like, how does somebody like me, I'm old, inexperienced, you know, self-taught, only only halfway away from being a total moron. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so I was just like, 
I'm just going to keep studying and keep talking to people. And, and Mike had brought this up and, and they were like, yeah, we'll meet with him. I met with them. It went, it went good. And now we're like, they're going to let me tag along. And even though I'm not really part of it, if I do something that's good, they're going to use it. And I get to learn from this person who is a 25 year web dev professional. You know, this is a person who's been doing it for like basically the whole time people have been doing it like this. And, and it's like to learn from somebody with that much experience, I think it's going to be really cool. And I'm just really, really excited about it because that's all about to start happening right now. Yeah. No, it's, I just it's, signed it's, up for G I got my Jira account <laughs> ready, oh, ready. We're going to start, we're rest gonna start doing peace. a sprint. <laughs> hail, hail Jira. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have no idea. You will learn to love and loathe everything about Jira. Um, I don't I don't know anything about anything. So this he he even said he was like, I don't know if it makes sense for us to use this because it's just you and me that's gonna be writing React right now. So he was like, This is a thing that people use. So I'm it gonna totally show you how is. it works. And the, you know? the thing about Jira is a lot of the fundamentals and a lot of the concepts that you're gonna learn working with Jira, they really apply to, you know, most work situations generally. Like especially as you work in software and you see more agile methodologies you are likely to see the notion of things like sprints and tickets and issues and linking. And so um, even the alternative tools that are out there, a lot of them are going to look similar, feel similar. The main thing about Jira, I think, is learning how to chunk your work and how to intel like how to really thoughtfully scope out work and describe it. And then just documentation. Like my biggest thing I always tell my team with Jira is I'm like, guys, I don't really care what, you know, format we use for the titles or if we come up with a template for issues or whatever, do what you want to do. But anytime something happens relevant to that ticket, if it's an email, if it's a DM, if it's whatever, or you're on a call with somebody, put a note into Jira because that's a huge aspect of it is that that's knowledge management of just adding in comments as you work your way through a problem, not only for others on your team, um, but even for yourself, like I'll, I'll have tickets that have existed for over six months. It's not a great thing when it happens, but it happens sometimes, you know, things get buried Unacceptable. and I'll, I'll come across it. And it, I love when I, you know, had the foresight to put in some detail. Um, but then there's other times where I'm just like, oh, I have no idea what I did. I totally forget. I know there was like some blog article I found that exactly described the issue, but uh, I don't have the link for the blog article and I can't remember anything about it. And it was eight months ago. So I think just using it to just practicing the mentality of kind of keeping notes, keeping, you know, tracking your progress and, and being intentional about that, especially if you're working in teams. I mean, obviously, it's way more relevant there. If you're just doing solo work, you don't really need to put that much effort into it. But, uh, but yeah, that's what he said. I mean, he said as much with just us as well. He was like, if this looks like it's going to be more work just to use the software, then we'll <laughs> stop using it. He just wanted me to see what it was like to make a sprint to assign tasks to me and then for me to like try to chisel away at them because he, he understands yeah. that I don't actually know how to do anything. You know what I mean? So it's like, he's just kind of like, look, I'm just going to throw you into the deep end. And then when you need help, then what we're going to reconvene and I'm going to show you like, what's up, you know? So it's, yeah. uh, it's exciting, dude. Like they're rebuilding their product and he is going to let me like try to contribute and also learn and, he's already been really cool man like he's had like private meetings with me and just like shown me how to set up my like the project the way he does it with like you know specific configs which i don't really understand but still just to like even even just like pushing a commit the way he sets up his project with github it like runs a bunch of tests before it even goes up like i've never done anything like that you know what i mean and it's <laughs> it's really cool you know because it's obviously more uh close to how it's done for real you know right I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the whole thing. It's all, it's all about to start. He's putting together the task list right now. So we just set up Jira. He set up the repo, um, showed me how he does uh, branch naming and, and like how he wants me to do commits and like just all, you know, set up the linter and all that stuff. And he's breaking up the tasks and we're going to start building. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's go, go, go. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I love that. And so um, I think, I mean, you hit on a lot of things there, but. I love, uh, first, I just want to touch on what you said about that real world tangible experience, you know, and kind of making the transition from working through tutorials and all of that. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. And you, you definitely learn so much so quickly. 
So you're referencing, you know, tool chains and configs. And I think that's a big part of development that you'll never really get from tutorials, right? Some of this stuff, you'll never really use it or play with it too much unless you're, you know, you know to look for it. Um, but once you join a team who's using those things, you have to learn pretty much all of it really quick. And I think one of the, one of the things I talk about a lot, uh, especially with people, you know, early in their tech journey is you have to learn how to accept certain magic. Like there are things that are just magic and you have to learn to just trust and accept the magic sometimes, even if you don't understand it comprehensively or how it does what it does. And I think it can be a really that's difficult. Whole, that's, every, that's everything for me right now. <laughs> and I think that's that, but it can be a, I mean, depending on who you are, I think for some, it can be a really difficult part. Like I, I like to holistically learn things. I like to learn it comprehensively. So for me, I go down really deep rabbit holes sometimes because I want to know exactly how and why it works. Um, but especially when you're learning, everything is going to be like that. And so I think it's really important to learn, like when you learn prettier or something, you know, you can spend 15 minutes to two to three hours, depending on how deep you go and how much you know beforehand, learning how to get it working and running in your project within your editor, right? You can either get a basic config set up in your folders. And then if you're using VS code wired in, so it just formats on save or do a, you know, other options we format on save yeah format on save is the good one i won't even mention the other ones because they can be controversial <laughs> um but i think that <laughs> theo made have made a couple videos about certain techniques so we won't get into that <laughs> but um i think yeah, that... my, my prettier is all set up by him <clears throat> my linter is all set up by him so my code is like i hit save and it looks nice <laughs> <laughs> but once you get that that part set, it's like functionally you're you're using the magic. If you had to go and configure a special like rule or something, sure, you would have no idea. You'd have to go back and research how to do something special with Prettier. But sometimes having the team and the individual and the people around you to come in and just hold your hand over that first hurdle and say, hey, here's the basic stuff. Here's what to throw in there. Just accept it's going to do a bunch of magic, right? And if you're able to sit there and just accept that with open hands and go, cool, I got some magic now. I'm just going to put that in my back pocket. Maybe I'll learn more about it later. But meanwhile, I can just move on to the next thing. Um, I think that's an important skill in learning because you will hit so many potential rabbit holes in tech and in development that being able to separate it and just say, all right, I got all this magic. I've learned 5% of what there is to learn about that, but that's as much as I need to know to use it. You know, sometimes it's just what's in the readme. There's huge open source projects you're going to use that do tons of crazy stuff. But sometimes you just need to read a couple paragraphs in the readme to go, okay, this is the command. This is the component, right? This is the markup, Funny, whatever you had, it is. Uh, you had mentioned that to me before about, you know, a lot of the tools that I'll be using and that people use in general, that they have GitHub readmes and kind of like, uh, what did you call it? They were like problem texts or like just like uh like uh a ch like the a conversation issues. basically the issues thank you thank you i was like <clears throat> I to find the word and no, just right. reading through some of that stuff to learn how to use things better i started to do that a little bit and just going when i could to the straight to the repo to learn what i could and it's interesting there's a lot more information there than for instance what i'm really trying to say is like in code academy they don't really talk about that they they do teach you to go to MDN and to search properly, but it's like, they should talk about that too. Like there's a lot of info right there. The people that made the stuff are probably talking about it. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I was yeah. just talking to somebody. I, it's funny. I even forgot that we had that conversation, but that might've inspired this on Saturday morning. I was in a Twitter space and people were just talking about um, how to, how to have a good GitHub profile. So they were mainly talking about tricks for what, what do you put on your GitHub profile? What makes a good GitHub profile? And my GitHub profile looks terrible. So I'm not really an expert there, but they started asking questions about like, well, what do recruiters look at or what do hiring managers look at? And as a hiring manager, I went on stage to kind of share a bit about that. But even as, as we were talking about GitHub profiles um, and what you're looking at, I went on, I just realized, um, and kind of went on this side rant where I was like, guys, you don't understand. There's so many open source companies out there that do full-time work on open source projects and they're using GitHub issues and like, that's their full-time job. And you can just go and kind of spy in on it, you know? And I was doing this going through some of the Astro companies tickets. So Astro is this front end framework 
super awesome. We'll probably talk about it and have you make a little website with it at some point in our conversation. I'm familiar with it, um, but I don't, I've never used it. Obviously, I've just, I'm familiar with what it is. Yeah, so super fun framework. Um, but you know, going into their repositories, like they're a company that builds open source software. And so you can go in and actually see them going back and forth on like how to write good documentation. And I just found myself scrolling through some of their stuff, learning just cause I like, I'm curious about what goes into good documentation, wanting to learn more about that. And I was like, this is such a trove of valuable information. If you just find whatever open source company, I mean, You've got Vercel, you've got Meta and React, like all of these people have GitHub issues or RFCs or some contributing process. And that's such a cool aspect of the open source world, I think, that I love is there's so much potential learning in when you're working in the open. And the way that companies have learned to finance open source in different ways, it's so cool that it gives us that opportunity to watch people who have the opportunity to work full time, dedicate their full nine to five to open source. Um, but are still working in this kind of free, open learning environment that the world gets to learn from. There's my, my open source rant of the evening. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to, uh, man, we're, we're already, time is blowing by. So you went through everything. I, I was kind of open for a quick intro, but you gave kind of the full story, which I love. I want to zero <laughs> in went. on, you went for it. No, it's beautiful. I want to zero in on one thing. So I know we don't want to, you know, you're not super interested in the music stuff, but as you're talking about the t-shirt story, my brother-in-law is a musician and he's toured for many years. And one of the things that always struck me is he has all these great stories, you know, like every city, every uh, like place they played pretty much, there's some adventure, there's some occurrence that happened and it's just goofy stuff to like crazy, you know, chance occurrences whatever you have it when you're you know getting to a place setting up playing a set and then moving on to the next place just it seems fun times happen so the one question i did want to ask you was do you have any any fun story like that or something that's like a really good memory from either time on the road or even just in music it could be you know not necessarily on the road or on tour but just playing with i mean dude there's so many my god it was a long (laughs) i mean it was a long time 20 years um you know it's funny, like in hindsight, some of the smaller things become big memories because it got to the point where it was, you know, selling out arenas all, like all over the entire planet, every continent. And um, it it can become pretty, you can be, you can get pretty jaded when it gets like that, you know, when you just like go from one arena basement to the next, they don't. They, they start to look real similar. You start to forget what country you're in, you know? Um, yeah. So, like, the uh, the opportunity to do stuff like that is pretty amazing. Um, the fact that I got to do that is pretty remarkable because uh, it was so consistent for so long. It wasn't just, like, a one-shot. It, it went on for, for many, many, many years like that at that level. But I think that one of the most memorable things was really – some of the smaller shows, you know, for instance, coming back to your city and playing like mm. that venue, you know, that you grew up watching shows at, that can be a lot more meaningful than, you know, I mean, I've won VMAs in many different countries. I've, I've like got to do a lot of cool stuff like that, that, you know, from the outside might seem like a more meaningful experience. But the truth is, is like sometimes just coming back to Detroit and playing a small venue like, uh, you know, like the, at the time it was called the State Theater. Now it's now it's uh, the Fillmore, but back then it was called the State Theater. And it's just like our downtown, you know, mid-sized theater that like just had the most epic concerts. The ones that shape your whole kind of outlook of like, this is why I want to do this. <laughs> you know? mm. So to be able to come back to a place like that and sell it out and have it be like, one of the better shows that you've played during that touring cycle. Cause I remember the, the show in Detroit when we were playing that tour was just like a really special one. And that was really, really meaningful to me to be able to come to that venue to sell it out headlining. You know what I mean? Not, not a radio show, not any, like it's your show. Everyone's there. And then it's a great show. Not, not just a great show, but like one of the best shows of the whole tour. And that's comparing to New York and LA and Chicago. Cause like Chicago yeah. is really for the Midwest, like one of the best cities to play in. Uh, it just, 
great, great music town. And then LA and New York are just like epic, epic, epic entertainment epicenters, you know? So it's like the shows are just really, really uh, high stakes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the fact that like your hometown show at that venue could be that special. And that was a long, long, long time ago. Like after that, there was many, many, many years of like meteoric rise to success. But that really still sticks out. I mean, hold on. <laughs> it's literally the only ticket stub that I have. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it's, it's literally oh my right gosh. There. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, man. That is, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. Oh, man. I'm like, it's literally the only one I have. Like, I have never saved a single ticket stuff from the whole entire. That's like, epic. Career, but, yeah. That so that, so that was like really something because, you know, I mean, I don't know, like, if you're not like a music person, maybe it doesn't mean anything. But when you grow up going to concerts and like that's what that was your thing, like those venues, especially when you're a kid and like you can only go to your city to go see shows, you know, because you're not like old enough to like travel around and like road trip to go see a concert. Those venues become mythic to you. You know what I'm saying? You don't know right. anything yet. So you, like everything is just unbelievable to you. Like now. I know how everything works. I'm I'm a bit jaded right. when it comes when it comes to that. But back <laughs> when you're that age, when you have no idea how these things even come to be, like you bought this ticket and now you're here and this thing is happening in front of you and you're like, how does this even exist? Those venues, those places, they become almost like, uh, you know, they're like cathedrals. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, no. they're places of worship. You know what I, mean? I mean, it really is. Yeah, I, I I grew up. You know, we. I went to quite a few shows and, and grew up in the greater Los Angeles area. So a lot of those crazy, you know, high so stakes. So you grew up in, in, like a, in like a, in like an entertainment epicenter. You know what I mean? It's right. different when you grow up with that kind of access to shows because every single act that's going to go through is going to come through your town. When you grow up in the mm. Midwest like that, like it, you're, you, you don't get to see every tour. Like they don't always come through your town. Right. Yeah. So when somebody does, it's like a thing, especially if it's like the hot, group at the time or like the hot act whatever that right, is right yeah yeah it's different so it becomes very meaningful so when that when i got to do that when i got to be that and we were popping at the time you know it was really something <laughs> hence the yeah. ticket literally behind me still <laughs> i love that oh man well yeah because it's not only you know understanding it but being kind of at the pinnacle there as well um well dude thank you for sharing about that so yeah, absolutely so do you remember, I mean, you kind of mentioned this is, is newer for you, but do you remember the very first code that you wrote? Yeah, it was in Ruby. It was Ruby? Yeah, it was Ruby. And it was like probably a hello world. But like, I guess like the first Ruby code, let me see if I can find it. I think it's in my phone. <laughs> I, I, I made a palindrome app. Mm. <laughs> I think it's, it, oh. it's a palindrome detector. <laughs> Okay. Is it a palindrome? <laughs> that's that's way uh that's way cooler than the simple hello world. You did like a, a well, yeah, well, this, interview this question like towards the, in one of your first. This was like uh, towards the middle of the tutorial. Obviously, every first code is hello world. I guess right, the better question right, right. is, what's the first code that you wrote that it actually did what you wanted it to do, <laughs> and you could, and you just did it. That's a better question, and I know exactly how to answer that one. If you want to see it. All right. How would you answer that question? I'm gonna pull it up on the screen and show you. I that's, love that you're helping me out with the interviewing as we go. You're just like, here's the question you meant to ask. Ah, this yes. This is the question you Good meant point. to ask. <laughs> you, you yeah. were correct. Would you look at that? I'm looking for... There's a bunch of shit in here now. So was there a course that had you doing Ruby? Or was that one of the t first tutorials was a Ruby tutorial? That was the thing. Remember I told you my buddy who wanted, who told me to just do it, he recommended that. He was like, Ruby's super easy. <laughs> Got it. No, it is. And I, I love Ruby. So I, I had full-time jobs. I worked mostly in like, I worked in PHP for like five to seven years. And then I worked in Ruby for five or six years. And I love Ruby, man. It is just a beautiful language. It's very simple. It also has some foot guns and can get complicated, but the like eloquent idiomatic Ruby that that community kind of fixated around can be just such a nice programming experience. You see this 
beautiful code in front of you? Or am I just sharing my camera only and not my screen? You're just on your camera now. Yeah. Shit. Hold on. <laughs> How do I... Can I do that is the question. Um, If you have OBS, you can do a virtual camera. But okay, that might me. be tricky. I do. I have OBS open right now. I'm recording this. So if you hit start virtual camera on the bottom right. Oh, I have Streamlabs. Does it not have that? Um, it might be in settings, but if you go to like preferences, you want to look for virtual camera and that basically makes it mimic a webcam. So then you can pick that install virtual webcam. (laughs) Oh, wait, can I send it to you? Just go to to my, it's, it's public. It's public. Go to my GitHub and find mysterious organism. (laughs) I love this. (laughs) And you will see it. The moment that I knew I was going to become a software de- developer. <laughs> Mysterious organism. <laughs> um, what's your... Surprisingly, there's a lot of those, actually. So. Uh... Oh, because my, I'm Tomo from Earth. Yeah, because that's a Code Academy project. That's right. From... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, here we go. All right, I'm going to have to switch right. my... Uh scene over real quick to share this with stream um don't judge my code harshly okay this is baby <laughs> code but this is the first the, why this one is the one okay it's because one you see i have nice comments everywhere so i did nice commenting uh the console logs are in the middle don't worry about that that was just because like in the code academy editor the way they have it set up i wanted to return like i, I this is my uh my reporting showing that the the thing did what it was supposed to do so I know it's ugly, but it worked really nice with like how it was set up on their page, if it makes sense. Yeah. Because because like the way they have it set up is there's like on the left hand column, like imagine it's like a a, a grid layout, the, and there's like three columns. So the left hand side is going to be like the problems. The middle is your code editor, and then the right hand side, third column is like the console. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why this is like this. Uh, I know that's not how you would really do that if you're doing it normal, but it looked normal for no, my yeah. envir- for my environment. <laughs> so you said this was the first code that really did what you wanted it to do. Like it, it, so would you they say gave, this is where something clicked for you? This is just like they gave us only very open-ended um, situations like this is what your story is. You you are a developer for a, a science research team, okay? And they need you to come up with a program that will mimic, randomize, and then test strands of DNA based on certain criteria, right? Yep. So if you yeah, read my you comments, the... they, they kind of explain what everything's doing. But the point is, is even though I recognize that this is really, really simple and really dumb, it it works like it does exactly what it's supposed to do and i could like i couldn't believe it when i finished doing it i was just like holy shit it actually does it like it actually does it and i didn't have to look anything up i didn't have to google anything like i could just do it and that's why i was so excited by it because you know even with the code academy projects they're like you know you'll likely have to look stuff up and you'll probably be googling syntax and that's totally fine that's how people do it but for this one i had really been studying really hard and I just could do it. Like the situations that they gave us, I just knew exactly how to write the code to make it do that. And I was just like, holy shit, dude, it's, I'm actually learning it. You know? <laughs> and that's the hook. Once that happened, I was done. It, it was over. Like my music career ended that day. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a moment. Yeah. I, I love that. So I, I feel like you're speaking to the, you know, not just the coding side of it and the code accomplishing a task, but the problem solving side of it, right? You went through the goal, the task of designing the actual solution. You were given a problem definition. So exactly. it wasn't just you implementing the logic, you finding the keywords and the syntax to make the code do a thing. It was the fact that you were given a looser problem with some kind of definition, but really how you implemented it was left to you. It was the, you got to engage in not just the implementation, but the creative problem solving side of the process, 
which that's I, why I think it, is that's so... why it turned me on. That's why it turned me on so much is because exactly what you just said. They gave us very loose situations. The information that we did get from them, they tried to mimic it as if it was what the scientists would be giving me as inputs and things like that. You know, right. and I know it's bullshit, but like in the moment that you're doing it, especially at that stage of no, the course, yeah. it, it feels difficult. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it was really hard for me to do it, but I did it. And like, well, I was just and, like, holy and, shit. <laughs> no, I love that. And I was going to say, if we were to do a impromptu code review here, I mean, man, you're using some arrow functions. You're, you're commenting all of your code. All of your methods are commented. You're using const and let in the right places. Like you've got some knowledge of scoping. I mean, I see a lot of good stuff in here, man. I was I was just scrolling through and I'm like, they they whatever course tutorial you're working on, they did some, you know, as a JavaScript developer, I'm I'm glad that they're showing you good JavaScript too. Like you're using string templates in here. I mean, they got a lot of the newer stuff you should be using. So that's the thing. I mean, and and you were talking Codecademy. about the fact <laughs> you were studying. Yeah, codeacademy.com. <laughs> you're talking about the fact that you've mentioned like six times. I should know that at this point. But um <laughs> I like the the fact that you mentioned how you were studying as well. And I think that's one of the tricky parts is not knowing everything and getting that muscle memory of knowing, you know, what to reach for. And it's not always feasible or reasonable to study just a language API, like go read the thousand methods and make, you know, flashcards out of everything in the standard API. Um, but I do think there's, I've found you know, quite helpful at times to just go really deep on one part of a language or one part of an API and just learn like everything about that. And with JavaScript, I've done that a bit. Like I've used it interspersed throughout my career. And sometimes when I come back to it, I'll just go and grind all of the like, you know, W3 and like latest specs and RFCs and ES 2017. And, you know, we can, we can dig in on that stuff later, but, um, it's a bit of more just like you can go really hard on learning the specific aspects of the language. And I like with Codecademy and a lot of academic places when they do update their curricula too, because we had a long time where the, the learning resources were not as good as they are in 2022 for developers. So I love people complain about some stuff in Codecademy. I, I don't, I don't know that it uh, applies so much to me at my stage. Cause they have like, varying degrees of uh experience you know they have like intermediate to advanced stuff there as well like if somebody like you wants to brush up on something that's not so familiar they have stuff for people like you as well is my point um or well maybe not you but you know what i mean like people that like you know if you need to brush up on something that's more complicated they have stuff designed for like those quick kind of rundowns as well for professionals right. but uh uh shoot i lost my train of thought what was i just gonna say um, 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 oh, they have a side project that I was going to do on there that I wanted to ask you about. It's recreating the Lodash library with just vanilla JavaScript. Ooh, I just, like they're, the they're sound like, of they're that. Like, if you want to really, if you want to really uh, cement your JavaScript skills, there's a, a side project that you can do recreating the Lodash library with vanilla, like just recreating all the functions. <laughs> that would be, a, that's a really good project um, because... I, yeah, that that would be a challenge for sure. That's where I'm like, yeah, it would be tricky. Um, I don't know. Well, if they I, said you know. in the description they were like, it's not the full, full, full functionality, but it's like the surface level, uh, functionality of right. Yeah, the stuff they're like, they're like each function can go much, much deeper. This is gonna teach you how to. I think that the goal there was to teach you to understand what is a built-in method or a, a method from a library really doing like if right. you can really understand what it's doing at the core level it will make you it will help you to make better to choose better methods i guess you know so there's a couple resources that do that really well and yeah it's it's exactly what you're saying i think is what it would accomplish um the reason i chuckled when you mentioned lodash is because i think one of my favorite JavaScript books is by John Resig. So he's the guy that invented jQuery and just a brilliant, brilliant JavaScript wizard. And he, um, he wrote a book called Secrets of a JavaScript Ninja. And that book had some awesome examples where he had bits of code that were basically Lodash type methods. And he would just write them in a, like over the course of a chapter. And that was one of the best educational experiences. This was when I didn't know a ton about JavaScript but he just would create like 
functions over the course of the book and then he would use them later and they were doing very basic things like logging out certain stuff like he would just make a function to do that but by doing that along the way he taught you how libraries kind of work because he was basically just building up little pieces of a library as he went through the book and it's a uh, it was really powerful i think learning experience just to understand like because then he would just say at one point, you know, he would build up a piece of code to a certain point, and then he would basically say, yeah, and that's basically what, like, this library or this function does in JavaScript. And he would have, like, rebuilt something in JavaScript, and he's like, oh, yeah, so I actually just use this, but, like, we just made a mini-me version of it, right? And it wasn't that hard. Like, you understand fundamentally how this thing works now. Um, so that's really cool. That would certainly be a challenge project. It's, uh, I, I looked at it, it's... Uh, it's doable. I mean, they they guide you. It's not like a just like a, here's what the function's supposed to do. Go, good luck. Like they they guide you through it. Yeah. A little bit, you know. But it's I'm gonna definitely do it. Just not yet because right now I want to focus on what's coming up with this uh, work opportunity. Because like I said, it's it's a it's a favor. I don't yeah. want it to feel like a burden to them. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm available and and doing Definitely. what they ask of me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. And I, I respect that. And I know, you know, that's from a lot you know, of them too. I'm sure they, they appreciate they, that. They are, they're doing a, a lot. You know what I mean? It's a huge right. ask. They're giving their time to teach me. Like, like why, why would anybody do that? You know, I mean, like, before, we live in such a disgusting world. It's like, before, they're obviously such great. They're such great people yeah. clearly because like, you know what I mean? Like we just don't live in that world. <laughs> Well, hey, I mean, if, if you're a quick learner, you're going to be providing value as well pretty quickly. So don't undersell yourself either because, I mean, just from what you've done so far, I know for a fact you're going to be able to get in and start creating some good code before too long. And most companies too, I, this is something I talk about with a lot of you know people at work where um, depending on the company and the level of the role, there's frequently, the companies will just assume there's an onboarding time of like three to six months sometimes before somebody's really going to be up to the speed or velocity of like one of your core developers who's been there for a couple of years. And that depends on a lot of factors and variables, obviously. But at the end of the day, it's just like you're going to have to learn so many specifics about where you're working as well. Um, there's typically a good amount of ramp up time. And, you know, I think it's it's important and shows a lot of value when like one, I think people are good at learning and engage really quickly early on where you're going to catch up pretty quick. If you're, you know, investing yourself and really picking up and learning all of the standards, all of the standard tooling, you know, the stuff you talked about the guy walking through you through, um, I think that's super helpful, but yeah, it's, Looks it's something, everybody. it's something that just like every org has so much, they're going to have so many different ways of doing different things that you always end up learning stuff when you join a new org. And I, I enjoy the distinctions. You know, I think that's one of the cool parts is what's best for one org isn't always best for another. And everybody's got different requirements. And that goes into that problem solving that you were talking about. So I, I do want to dig in on that one more. So that pulls me back to something you mentioned in the beginning. And I really liked how you talked about programming as something that came up sort of as a, you know, a time sink. In, during the pandemic it was like this is something to occupy my mind and to you know to do something it's, fun <laughs> he knew me he knows who i am so he was like he knows that i need something that's going to uh be challenging and and like force me to really dig in you know i i i am bored very quickly by stuff if it's too easy to learn and this obviously is not that so <laughs> You right. know what I mean? So I was, so like here we are, like a year, you know, a couple, about a year and a half later, and after nine months of going really hardcore, I'm now, you know, unofficially interning for this group, and it's like they're gonna let me do shit, and I'm and I'm going to work hard, you know. Knowing your strengths is important, right? And I know that I don't know very much, if anything, useful at the at this very moment right now but my superpower is that i will work very hard i will put in insane hours into something because i don't have any tie downs you know what i'm saying like i don't have kids my wife and i we didn't have a family we didn't want to do that we we never wanted to have children so we didn't <laughs> yep. and and i own my house i'm re i'm a retired musician yeah. I, i'm chilling all i do all day long i wake up i have my coffee 
I sit in front of my computer. So if there's something to be done, like that's that's what I'm gonna do all day long. I love Every how you describe day. that, <laughs> but I also feel I have to point out there are software engineers this world over who would also describe their daily exactly the same way. I wake up, grab my coffee, and sit in front of the that, computer all okay, day. Okay, but that's, that, all that is but, all that says to me is that I'm um, I'm in my tribe. You know what I'm saying? Because like that's my natural absolutely. state. I'm going to do that whether it's this code in front of me or whether it's a Pro Tools session with my music in front of me to edit or to mix or to a blank Pro Tools session or if I'm going to sit in front of my piano and like work something out. You know, I, st- I play my piano every single day, no matter what. I still play piano every day. I love playing piano more than anything. Uh, guitar cool. is like, eh, I, I'm just so bored by it. You know what I mean? It's, I, can't, <laughs> I can't even be bothered to pick it up. Um, but I play piano every day and I, and I, That's and I'm just not interested in making music. But the fact that you say like a lot of other programmers would describe their days the same. I'm like, hell yeah. That just means I'm amongst my people. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I love the, so the first thing I had a gut reaction when you talked about, you know, programming as, as something fun to do. I'm like, see, I'm one of the idealists that's like, I think everybody like should be able to code to <laughs> yeah yeah no exactly so i i'm i'm one of the idealists where i'm like i think everybody's gonna learn some aspect of coding in the next 20 or 30 years like it's it's gonna become kind of a core skill and core competency and i also think that anybody can learn to code which there are some people who are more on the gatekeepy side of things sometimes of like oh you need a certain you know a certain brain or a certain analytical mindset or a certain knack for well, problem check it out. solving Let, or whatever uh, you anyone um, can learn to write code but I'm not so sure that anyone can learn to be a programmer. Those are not the same thing. You know what I mean? Like to be like that top level understanding how to problem solve or like the people that like design whole system architectures. Like I'm not sure that everyone can learn how to do that. I I don't know how far I'm going to go on this. Like my brain is challenged already by all this stuff. You know what I mean? And I'm in like doing like, I don't even know what the scope of it is, but I'm assuming this is kind of like not as difficult as other things. You know, web dev is <laughs> not as complicated as like uh, I'm, building computers or something. It's, like that. it's a little more. It's it's a more cushioned area of programming for sure. <laughs> See, you know, I, don't, there's a I, don't little wanna, more... I don't know. Like, I don't want to speak out of turn and be. Like, it's kind of like, like the trampoline. It's like the it's like the Chuck E. Cheese. It's more like the trampoline house. Like your pretty <laughs> padded walls. Everything's pretty safe and comfy. So. Um, no, but I, I think, no, I, I think that, um, I mean, one, I, again, I, I'm kind of an idealist on this, but I do want to think that anybody can't, well, there's one huge backdoor in my opinion on this. And it's that when I talk about coding, I think it's more than just what people traditionally refer to as programmers too. Like I know tons of people that use data stuff. They use Python or they use even just stuff in spreadsheets in their day-to-day jobs that are not at all programmers or software developers. And so I think Mm. that's sort of the backdoor in my opinion is I think a lot of normal jobs will incorporate aspects of coding, aspects of working with and managing data and understanding how to kind of script and automate things. And so at at kind of that level, I would would say there are people, but I mean, if you look at it from the problem-solving perspective too, I say there's a lot of people in tech. You look at program managers, product managers, even people in marketing doing kind of product oriented marketing. And they're sometimes doing ideation and problem solving that's technical in nature. So I also just, I I like having a big spectrum and a big, you know, inclusive group for tech too. And I kind of talk about tech and it's like, we got uh, UX UI artists in here. Like it's, um, I definitely didn't want to like sound like I was saying like some people can't do it. That's not what I meant. I I just feel like there's a big difference between like, because I'm realizing that myself, you know what I mean? Well, I'm realizing that there's a big difference between like learning how to recognize the syntax and write the syntax and having somebody say, I need something that does this and being able to just figure it out. Like that is a big, big wide gap between those two things. <laughs> see, it, it isn't, it also isn't because on the other hand, you know, you're, you're looking at this from the last couple years, you know, you've, you've got a handful of years and I would say, you know, the guitar didn't always bore you before you spent the years you spent playing music. So I think there's also an incremental aspect where with tech, I think it's so easy to so quickly see the pinnacle 
where even if it's not like the best of the best, but just people using everything there is to use in tech is highly intimidating. If you turn on a Primogen stream and you see somebody <laughs> blasting around NeoVim and writing Rust and doing crazy stuff, you're just like, there is so much I clearly don't know. And I think that... <laughs> Especially it's, him. But part of it, I think it, you would find it similar in other... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think you would find it similar in other industries where it's kind of like, you need the years, but once you put in the years, and for some people, for some individuals, it might be very different numbers of years. But over time, I think anybody can kind of learn enough because especially in technology, I think so much of it is like stacking bits of information. And a lot of people that trend towards software development tend to be lifelong learners. And I don't think you, yeah. I think you do have to be at some level, like there's a minimum level of lifelong learner that just in software development, you kind of have to be to survive. I can't imagine but, uh, being able to do this job without enjoying that process because right i mean even in the time that i've started learning there's been things that have changed and come out you know so it's like in the span of five years you're learning whole entire new technologies and frameworks multiple times over it's like exactly <laughs> well and i think that's why it's important like one of my soapboxes i get on a lot is i got a traditional four-year degree in computer science which is not as standard as it once was for for the tech industry. Um, and a lot of times, even in school, you know, people are like, why are we learning about this theoretical stuff? Like I had an internship and we just went and wrote all of this and used this stuff and these frameworks are there. Why are we even talking about these things? And I always saw the value in it because if you learn the fundamentals, then it makes it easier to learn new things too because everything kind of boils down to the same stuff at the end of the day. So if you understand the fundamentals of what the technology is doing, it's very easy for me to pick up an actual language spec and just kind of like literally browse through the spec for a language and, and or like a framework that like you can pick up, I'll just go through the docs top to bottom and get a pretty decent feel for what they're doing and how they're doing it. But most of that is because I have like years of context built up where I can draw analogies to other frameworks and other things I've learned so I can go, okay, they're doing like some rendering stuff here. Okay, their asset pipeline kind of reminds me of Rails. Like I can make those connections. And I think over time, so the more, like the more opinions on Twitter that I might argue with or, or they would speak to an analytical requirement or like your brain needs to work in an engineering way requirement for software engineering. I talk more, when I talk about what's critical to learning software, I talk way more about capacity to learn and like how well you learn and how much you enjoy that process, and two, resilience. And those are the things where I'm like, way more than anything else. You can give me somebody who's done, you know, arts and theater their entire life, never touched a math book or done any analytical anything in their life, but if they are really good at learning and they are really tenacious, I can make a programmer out of that individual. And that's sort of like, that's been my mentality, is those things are way more core, and a lot of people think there's a sort of technical brain I think there are brains that work better with technical concepts. And I like, I say this as a kid that was using my dad's Windows 3.1 computer when I was like four or five years old. So my brain always worked well with computers. Um, but I also think that anybody can learn enough to be effective in software development and software engineering, um, regardless of kind of their background, regardless of discipline. Um, and I think at this point, you know, we've seen so many examples too. You've seen so many like, super high performing people at the top of the industry coming from different backgrounds, having different takes on software development and on coding. And I love that, you know, diversity in the scene as well of you've got crazy people like prime there on their NeoVim 24 seven. Then you've got other people coding in Figma or something. I don't know, but we're all making <laughs> stuff and getting cool <laughs> things done. <laughs> yep. I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm here for it. So stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how long you had tonight. I want to respect your time because I know it's getting a little late here. Um, but real quick, I wanted to touch on sort of so what this is going to look like. So we're going to be continuing to talk and kind of touch base. Um, and so we're doing at minimum, our commitment is going to be at least once a week, we're going to do a coffee chat for 15 minutes. And this may or may not be on stream. Sometimes it might be voice chat, but at minimum, we're going to check in once a week and Tomo and I get to just, he can share updates on kind of what he's learning. 
And the way I'm going to structure these is basically how we do uh, daily standups at work. I've done this in many organizations. Um, and it's kind of the classic standup formula. So you share what I've done in the last week. You share. Wait, wait, what wait. You're... Should, I, should I put my desk in standup mode? <laughs> Okay, no, I'm, we're not I'll, doing I'll, it yet. I'll see myself when we do on, the I'm meetings, gonna, yes, we'll okay. have to we'll we'll have to all stand up, and that's going to be the um, that's the rule. It's a stand up meeting. Why do you think they call it that? It's it's part of the deal. Um, but yeah, so we'll just share what what you've worked on the last week, what you're working on the next week, and then any issues or blockers that you hit. What were the walls? I'll find or out also you from these dudes if it's okay with them if I share their stuff that I'm working on. Yeah, yeah. So definitely talk to them if they ha if they're working on anything that they do have open source for whatever reason, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't well, none care of this if this is goes open source, stream. but 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 I, it's their product, you know what I mean? But it doesn't exist either. Like their their whole entire uh, software. I don't know. Like what would be the technical term? It's a uh, it's a it's their IP. It's, a, it's their intellectual property. It's, their IP exists in the in Angular, and they are going to remake the entire thing in React with me. Got it. Well, yeah, we could we could touch base on that. I don't want to open up I'll ask any them. potential sure. cans of worms, but that could be I cool if we could bring those in. I get um, the vibe; it's not going to be a big deal, but I'll ask. You so, I Tomo did have a couple projects though, because I gave him kind of homework already, and I asked him to come up with a couple with three different ideas for things that we're going to work on, and so we we can. Definitely talk about some of the stuff that you're doing at work if they're okay with sharing code or they're okay with us discussing in more detail. Um, and some of that we could do off stream as well. So we can always just do a private off stream. Discord I'm call. sure it's not a big um, deal, obviously, but just on stream, I don't know. I mean, I don't think so, it would be a big deal, honestly. But so <laughs> as time does allow, because of course Tom is going to be focusing on this work and he's got a lot on his plate, but as time allows, we'll be able to make some work or make some progress on some of these side projects. So we can start some repos and work on something like sassy bot or doing some fun things sassy for bot exists API. already by the way oh sassy you did make a sassy exists. bot i gotta sassy check out your github already go to my yeah. github and you can i've deployed sassy bot you just have to look at it on full screen it's not responsive okay i love sassy it bot I love... already exists in her infancy sassy bot is just an amoeba right now just wanting okay. to exist she's Perfect. yearning to to learn and to become more brilliant. Oh man, I love it. <laughs> Why did you push not send button, me the dude. repo before? This is great. Dude, push um, the button. You won't do it. Go <laughs> to the, I've, I've deployed it. Go to my uh, GitHub pages on there. It's. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> this is not a React app. It needs to become a React app. This is still just a plain old uh, document get element by ID. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wait, what's the URL? Is it sassy bot? Sassy dash bot? There it is. <laughs> Push the button, dude. I'm pushing it. <laughs> she's talking That's to you, perfect. isn't she? I'm not hearing audio, <laughs> but she's giving me some sass. That's for sure. No, no there's no audio. There's no audio. Oh, man. No, no, well, she's speaking so, to you in the bubble. So room. we can work on iterating <laughs> on sassy bot. We can do some updates. Um, but yeah, all that to say... We're gonna we're gonna have some potentially some longer streams down the road where we can actually pair code on stuff and we can do it from both perspectives where I can drive and we can walk through a chunk of something and then we can do it also where you're doing the work um, and again as time allows we're gonna plan this out in the future so um, this will be over time you know but I'm I'm planning on clipping these into some videos and we'll have a little well, let's series just be clear out of about it, a couple so. of things I, I let's just be clear about a couple of things one. I use Tailwind CSS now, so I'm never writing vanilla CSS again. And two, I bought the Tailwind UI kit, so I'm never writing any code again either. <laughs> that's that's perfectly fine with me. That's great products, great technology, and great products. <laughs> I'll just have Adam write it all for me because he's better at it anyway. <laughs> that's the guy's name, right? That made Tailwind. <laughs> that's a huge... Um... I don't know actually who made Tailwind. That sounds right. I think it's, I think it's some guy named Adam something. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I love that. Hey, yes, that's that's such a good. That's such a good pitch for Tailwind right there. We definitely have to clip that. Um, yeah, Adam <laughs> Wathan. No, good call. It is Adam. That was a perfect Imagine writing sale. code. Imagine I love that sales pitch code. though. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is so cool. All right, so yeah, we're gonna have some like shorter episodes coming up, and so on my stream. Um, I'm going to get some schedules out here, but we're going to have
probably once a week, we'll have a mentorship stream where we'll do a couple of these coffee chats. So that might include Tomo, it might include some other people from the community, but we'll just do a, a little bit of rapid fire check-ins. Maybe I'll, I'll even uh, resurrect my stream since I'm here. I might as well turn mine on too next time, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, no, you definitely turn cool. your stream on, get people in there. Um, and using ping too, if we get some time together beforehand, I can help you set up uh, OBS stuff too. So you can even have, have me on your stream and vice versa. Um, but you should also, I would challenge you as you're getting into stuff. I mean, one, if you have time for the open source stuff or two, depending on if they have pieces that they're okay with being more public, um, but more, even just open source, you should stream more of your coding and learning as well. That's something that I think I was, there's been a big, so, well, check it out. I was doing that. I started doing that in the beginning of the year, but that's what I was saying in February. I don't remember when I posted, I posted a tweet, like I pinned it and I was just like, look, I'm going to tell you the date right now. No, just cause I'm curious profile. The, okay. So I posted this August 29th. So August 29th, I stopped going live and was like, look, I'm just going to not do focus anything. up. I'm just going to focus up. But in February, I started doing it very seriously and I was streaming and I was doing coding streams like once or twice a week and I was doing it live. But as soon as it got to be a little bit more complex, what I noticed was I was like, I'm not really retaining anything and I'm like going through the motions and I'm getting the shit done. But like when I wake up the next day, I'm not really remembering anything. It's already hard. It's already right. hard enough with every bit of my attention to retain anything. No, and now so that fast. I think about it, it's kind of terrible <laughs> advice too, because streaming while coding is super freaking hard. <laughs> and that's Stream something that I've while coding for fun. If I'm making something, that's fine, I think, because people can help and I can like Google things that I'll be playing music right. in the background and it's like whatever. But learning and actually studying that oh, yeah. those two don't mix because I'm trying to pay attention. I'm already bad at, at paying attention to my chat, to be honest. Dude, I'm ter I'm a terrible streamer. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so that's why I made that decision. I was like, I'm not going to go and do any Instagram stuff because I was also making like reels and shit just because for fun. Uh, I'm not going to do any like public facing things at all. I I'm just going to study. I'm going to treat it like a full time job and I'm not going to emerge until I have completed at least half of this program, which I'm about to accomplish. Uh, and then it's going to go into the, then it's going to go into the back end portion of it. Um. And I said I didn't want to reemerge until I was, you know, at least enter at least starting the conversation of trying to uh, weasel my way into a professional situation where I could at least hang around people and learn from people that are current professional developers on whatever level and whatever scale that is. People that currently what they do for a living is make things with code because that then at least i'm learning from people who are currently using things that are currently technologies that are useful you know and are vetted and that professionals use methodology um even stupid shit like just the folder structure dude like the way that this guy sets up his folder structure was i was like it was like a totally foreign thing to me you know what i mean and it makes so much sense and it's like oh yeah of course you're going to do it like that. Like, obviously, you know, what I mean? <laughs> folder structure and in react world, like folder structure is kind of a debate too. Cause that's something that's been controversial <laughs> where people are like, well, what's the right way to set up your folder st structure? And there's a tweet that's been immortalized <laughs> in a URL that I can never remember where Dan Abramov, the creator of react essentially said, uh, move stuff around until it feels right. And like, that was his <laughs> advice for how you make what a folders. Jerk. <laughs> and it was, but it and was just like, like <laughs> but the whole the whole point was sort of like you you come up with the structure that you need and react like react intentionally does not have an opinion on that. Like they believe it would be more harmful to be more opinionated in that regard. Um, and that's an interesting topic for frameworks in general. Like that's a big question with frameworks is how much they like how opinionated they are and how much they lean on convention versus configuration. Um, so that's a whole, that's a big conversation uh, story we could go down. But big I, conversation so I, I, story. I'm I, killing it with the words me, tonight, man. <laughs> for me, what he is doing uh, with my very uh, zero experience, it makes sense at least what I'm looking at. You know what I'm saying? So like you said, if it's something that's highly opinionated and people have a lot of different uh, viewpoints on <laughs> how that should be, at least what I'm looking at, 
is like in my brain makes sense so (laughs) i think what most of the community too has like coalesced around is is creating what you need and certain tools like you can reach for tools and libraries that do come with opinions on folder structure right so you can get different libraries and if you start using those they dictate exactly how you're going to lay out some of your structure at least to a degree and then there's other tools that will require you to put folders in certain places functionally you know if it's testing or linting there's certain tools where you might introduce it and say okay well now i'm going to move around or reorganize things but i think the main point of the react creator was kind of just you don't need the right way like you kind of just need a way and once you have a way make it work for you and then you know that's as much as you need like we don't want to go and define a perfect way of doing things as core react because you should be able to kind of work out what works best for your situation or what's the right way to organize your code um but we can uh oh man all right so we'll have to plan like a conversation to focus on because you're it's interesting my thought in you know doing more interviews on stream and stuff is a lot of the time what i'm looking to do is is speaking with people working in tech and getting their stories on things but maybe not going as hard technical as some of these, you know, same people in other interviews might do because they would focus really intensely on the technology they build. Um, so my goal is to do a little more like non-technical content for technical audiences, right? It's about stories and what your journey looks like, but we're not necessarily going to be like digging in on what the new things and the new release of your framework are exactly because I just want to assume everybody to be at that level um i'm like i'm like i'm like <laughs> but at, but at the same time sometimes i think when ironically, i watch sometimes when i watch theo stream i'm like i'm like vibing and then i'm like okay they're not talking to me anymore i'm gonna go <laughs> just lost it's like, no it's like, yeah All right, it's... I, I'm, I'm not uh I'll, well I'll when you have six months <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and on theo's stream too he has people that are like the smartest in the industry in the world potentially on this topic right like these are people that are literally creating the too. bleeding like, edge like, oh yeah you guys are losing me now man i don't know what the brilliant <laughs> brilliant conversations no i love that um but no i think at the same time ironically i was gonna say i feel like you are chomping at the bit more to have more technical discussions like you actually have dug in so much i feel like you are, you know, you're ready to kind of get in and talk about React stuff and talk about Tailwind. Well, uh, and... from it, as it pertains to me, the only conversations I want to have are technical ones. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about anything else at all. I mean, that I'm, is the point. Yeah. I'm, I'm completely uninterested <laughs> in anything else right now. Like, uh, I feel like, like people don't need, like, you need to understand when I say this, I'm being very literal when I say that I wake up. <laughs> have my coffee then i sit in front of my computer until i go to sleep like (laughs) don't do anything else at all i take care of my dogs i make i take breaks i walk around i go outside i let sun hit my face you know for about that's several things look at that that's a bunch of other things that's that's a bunch of great things that aren't in front of the computer (laughs) but that's it you know what i mean like (laughs) the only break is to you know (laughs) to use the restroom to feed and that's it That's the foreseeable future for me. I, I, I'm, I am not doing anything. So else you're until saying I am, until I am proficient. So you're saying we're <laughs> we're not gonna get any Crucible games in in 2022. I really look. Check it out. Check it out. Season we can sw- like immediately sidebar to Destiny two. <laughs> uh, tw- season nineteen coming up is having a proper ranked ladder system i did hear about this i okay. did read and, this this was like last a, week right listen they just as a pvp it. as a pvp wannabe warlord um <laughs> i do intend to grind that and see and like and test my metal and see how far i can get you know well i knew so i haven't played much destiny at all as of late um and i know that that you you know click on heads in the crucible i know you're a you're a fan of lord saladin's <laughs> and I was in my in the back of my head. I was like, man, I got to get back in and like at least unlock whatever subclass is the meta. Like I should at least figure out that much to like get the right abilities because I just haven't there, played there, a bit. Cr- but all of all three abilities are now in in three point oh. So you have that's solar, right. Yeah, yeah. Void and arc is all three point oh now, and I got a lot to catch up on. It's it's bust. The game is very very. Like you talking about, you're using 
ace of spades and like and like some kind of a shotgun or a fusion rifle. Yeah. I mean, I guess you'll you'll always be able to use a fusion rifle and a, and a hand cannon, I guess, but it's definitely not strong right now. It's all about sidearms and and other things. It's it's yeah. very it's a very I've, different game right now. I've played around with the sidearms a bit. I did hop in for a match a couple of weeks ago and try out the sidearm meta, and it was pretty nuts. Um, yeah, it's crazy. No, that's it'll be it'll be fun to into a bit but i really the the competitive ranking system is what caught my ear recently because my buddy and i have yeah. always been into competitive side of pvp and he immediately hit me up I, it was the twab right i think when they dropped the yeah, twab it, it was like a full pvp immediately twab. texted me and it was like no way okay if they actually have a real like ranking system that could be a lot of fun um, and so because for, for destiny that. pvp players there's never been a proper measure of your skill okay like other than something like tracker network which is really just for a game like destiny just doesn't do a good job because of the nature of how destiny is played you know what i mean uh but with destiny themselves making a system in game with their metrics based on wins and performance and all of those different things it's like yo this could be interesting because now in order for you to get to those top three ranks, like you do have to consistently win and consistently perform and be a contributor and have a team or whatever. So it's going to be fun. Look, as I'm talking about this, literally as I'm saying this and I'm just like, you're not going to do any of these things. <laughs> like yeah. You're living in this, you're living in this delusional like alternate reality where you're going to have time to do this because <laughs> I know that I'm not going to do any of it because I'm literally just going to fucking sit in front of my computer and keep studying. <laughs> <laughs> you might oh, be able to convince it. me. You might be able to convince me, but well, yeah, I, th I still think there's time. There's good times for mental breaks. There's good times for the, for me, video gaming actually picked up as in two periods of my life. It picked up as a main social thing. So I played a lot of games and destiny specifically. It actually started with destiny because I moved cross country. So I moved from California to Florida and didn't have any friends but all of my friends played destiny so we would hop in and raid once a week and that was a night that i knew i would always be able to like hang out with my buddies and uh then during the pandemic that was a big time with online gaming where i was just like i get on to play games in the evening because i can't like go and get a beer with my buddy right like it's just it's a different world and so for me i feel like it was an extroverted thing um and that still is like at this point I don't play any game really competitively or like I can't even keep up with the battle pass. Like I burned all my currencies trying to do battle passes and just never even oh. leveling it up. Cause I never had the time. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> there was a while where I was good. There was, about? there was a while where I would still like, even with a kid, I would, I would make the grind happen. I raided in world of Warcraft at one point post kid. I, so like I, destiny battle pass and i know that destiny grind is nothing compared to like some other games that exist out there i also like to play this game called fantasy star online too oh um, nice it's a, it's a japanese game uh i don't yep. play it either anymore but that like you, like super you, grind you want to talk about impossible grind that like you yeah. literally can never get there it's like <laughs> yeah I, I i enjoy that kind of game i do like it uh but with where my head's at and with like where i'm putting my focus even talking about it with you right now, it's like it's nostalgic and I get excited about it, but I know I'm not going to do it. I mean, there's different I'm, I'm, seasons I'm hyper focused, too. Like, dude. I'm like hyper it's a, focused. It's I ironic just... that you mention that because literally, like, I played uh, when WoW Classic came out. I played that for a while, and that was the pandemic game for me, right? That came out right around the pandemic. Or no, it came out when I actually, it might have been post pandemic as well, but I injured my back. So I was like on backrest, icing my back for like four to six hours a day. Ugh. And that was a period where I was just like, hey, I got, I have to be sitting on my butt, you know, most of the time anyways. Um, and so I played a lot of WoW. But recently, like, yeah, the last couple of expansions started coming out. I always enjoyed the game. Like, I really liked it. I really liked PvP. But my focus has been on other things. And so, like, I canceled, you know, I had multiple subs. So I was, like, one of those crazy people that I would, like, literally log on multiple accounts at once to, like, summon myself around. Um, but there's just... <laughs> There's different seasons, you know, and there was like, oh, there was a season where I had a lot of fun, you know, investing in that. And, you know, recently this year it has been a much more about me diving in on tech more. And it's not just like I do tech in my job, but this is uh, more about finding content creators who really like help me learn more and more deeply. So a lot of the framework stuff you're talking about, like Theo's 
interviews with people like Ryan Carniato and Ryan Carniato's streams themselves. I mean, those are like, you know, graduate level JavaScript. But man, those presentations that he does on Fridays are really, really insightful because he's just talking to, you know, some of the brightest people and talking with people, you know, hearing from people who have created some of the biggest, no, most notable tools in the ecosystem is just like a crazy thing we get to do now. Like, I, I think it's cool that I feel like this is a unique time in history where you have so many people making valuable content, helping others learn, but not just learn the basics, but also learn like the top tier of what's happening in the, like in JavaScript, at least, you know, this is part of why I love the JavaScript world. Um, but it's, it's really cool time. It's a cool time to be in, in tech and in web dev. So, um, Hey, as, well, the, as the entire industry just laid off 800,000 people. <laughs> I mean, also that, yeah, no, that is a whole nother topic. Um, I suppose we, that's like a whole other, like that doesn't affect me at all. Like I'm never going to try to work at a place like that. That's that I have zero interest in ever ending up in one of those places. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Long story short, the, the layoffs are something, that, I mean, it's painful, right? It's always painful. And especially for individuals that are affected for, you know, plans that are disrupted when they happen as, as quickly and as, you know, brutally, as brutally as they did. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, there's the fear of the impact. There's the fear of the trends and what it means. And on the first hand, yes, it's definitely harder to get a job in tech now if there's, you know, a glut of candidates from around the industry from these big companies who are highly competent engineers or whatever discipline they're in. Um, so there is a, an instantaneous kind of shift in the talent market, of course. That being said, a lot of these companies like Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, even said it himself, like they're really bloated on hiring. And so some of the specific companies that are doing this, it's like there's a lot of companies who also got tons of money to grow really quickly and did exactly that. And yeah. it doesn't always work out great, you know, and, and that's their consequences. And a lot of people, you know, even specifically with the Twitter example, like, yes, that's painful. Yes, there's an individual who's driving a lot of it. But at the same time, I could have told you with confidence back in – who? May or like like at least August of this year, I could have told you with confidence that Twitter was going to have a mass layoff before the end of this year. And I would have been correct. Like every big tech company has had this coming all year. And most people have known about it. Um, like our company was being, you know, going through to conserve really early in the year where they were basically like, we're not doing any crazy cuts, but let's look around for things we can tighten up proactively. You know, and if we're like about to hire a position, maybe we wait on hiring it for six to 12 months, you know, like we're just going to hold on to more cash and see what happens. And, you know, all these big companies have, you know, economists and very smart people analyzing these things and doing the same, you know, the same calculus. And so that's that the part where brutal, I think dude. it's like it, you got to you got to understand some of it's just going to come no matter what. But there is a there's definitely a pain in the industry right now. I just think macro level, like it's not going to drastically change the trend, right? This is more of a spike in a moment thing. And I think long term, there's many, many companies still out there who need people to write code. And there's much more code that needs to be written. And frankly, the the scope of the tech industry itself is I was kind of discussing earlier where I'm like, there's a lot of stuff you could kind of put in tech um that means it's going to be a growing industry i think for a while so i'm not concerned about the longevity of the industry writ large if you will if i was if i was in charge of firing people i would be brutal i i would be known as the i was i would be known as the executioner because i'm because i'm because i'm a cheap bastard and frugal as hell <laughs> Well, and I mean, hey, being a businessman sometimes is about, you know, talk to anybody in finance and people that are really competent in their jobs and They'd finance be like, oh, are shit. really good at Tomo's you know, coming. Tomo's bringing it down coming. to the numbers. So, hey, there's there's something to be said for just being a good businessman when you're doing that too, uh, or businesswoman. But hey, don't, well, don't get deluded. We're only here for one reason. It's to make money. <laughs> don't be deluded. Don't be deluded. There's everything exists only to make money <laughs> <laughs> all right well, I, wanna... I mean i think it's i mean you know you can like have a philosophical debate about that but those are the facts 
<laughs> well, no, I, I appreciate that. I was going to say, I'd love to, I'd love to go at it more with you on these philosophical debates. I was going to keep it a bit shorter tonight. So I was no, gonna... no, 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 I, no, for, it's 1130 for me. I'm gonna... Yeah. yeah. I want to let you get, get to bed here, but, uh, no, I, I think you, I just I've drank learned this coffee. What are you talking about? I've... I'm going <laughs> to go upstairs right. and let my dogs outside. I'm going to come downstairs and do a whole chapter in code Academy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I think I think I've learned a lot, and and many of us have learned a lot about the impact of money and capital in the last in the last month, in the last five years, in the last twenty years. You know, I think there's definitely been a lot of a lot of learnings, lessons learned. Um, I with just think that people that, in general so. need to be more honest with themselves about uh, what everything is really about, because like even. I, I, I'm not. I don't want to get in trouble or say anything. But like, even like activism is fun. Is a machine that needs money, and like the people that do it for a living are doing it for a living. You know what I'm saying? Like everything boils down to uh, growth and making something provide for something else. You know what I'm saying? It's most... like everything. Everything has that relationship, no matter what. And at the end of the day. If it is not leisure, it is money making. And it just is. It just is. It's just the world. The world is just that. So I think I think you just have to be honest with yourself about that and just make peace with that and then figure out how you can do something that you like to make money. <laughs> right. No, and I think that I like that you touch on that though, because it reminds me of this book that I read recently that was written by the CEO of meetup.com. And so he was brought in by WeWork, actually, the big company they made movies about that they acquired Meetup while they were getting tons of money. And then eventually they divested me, like they got rid of them eventually. And the CEO went through that whole process and had to kind of lead his company through it. Um, but no, he's got like, it's, it's his, you know, business advice book or whatever. So he's got lessons learned and all sorts of fun things. But one of his axioms that he puts in there is revenue is the lifeblood of the business. He was like, this was something that I had to kind of drill into my, in, into our values. We came in was, he was like, Hey, look, this is like, we're about all of these missions. We're about this impact. But also if we do not get revenue that makes sense, like if we don't balance our books and just make the money that needs to be made to keep this machine running, like you said, like we will cease to exist. So none of the mission stuff matters if we're not a sustainable business. And he put, he talks about how it's not like, I think the point you're kind of getting at as well is he talked about how like focusing on the revenue we're talking about the revenue shouldn't be considered a fundamentally toxic or negative thing it shouldn't like, be it's and that's just part really, of that, life like that's the that's reality really what i'm is, getting at is it's like yeah, it, these it's, mission statements about like oh we're here to like change the, it's like no you're here to make money like I, like it's fine like be inspired and like do these things also but be realistic you exist to generate profit and generally speaking <laughs> you're not going to be partaking in the, whatever mission you are describing if you're not making any money so it's like whatever the mission is if you're exactly. going to be effective you're definitely at not it, doing the mission it's kind of money. a prerequisite right like you have to get good at making money if you want to start pouring resources into the mission right um i, I don't oh, know i just have never really understood why that was such a taboo thing to just say you're a business like what, well what is, and it's interesting it's also interesting that that we're having this discussion now because it's kind of another meta discussion in software development and in kind of tech world is do you program because you just love programming or do you program just for the money just because it's a high paying job and there's twitter threads of people well, I like think if you can, only made five dollars a week would you still be a programmer or something and people are like no like if i wasn't well, making enough to feed my family that's not a fair argument because the right. work that it takes to be able to do the thing and the value placed on the task exists because so few people are willing to do the work to be able to do the thing like th those two things are you can say yes to both of those questions is my is my is my point you can right. say yes i program because i love programming and yes i'm doing it because you can make a lot of money doing it like that's totally a fine thing to say both right. of those things are totally fine to say i think <laughs> and that's where it's like it's been a big kind of back and forth too because you definitely have people that are gonna like, get trouble oh, for that i, I love just... code because i love I writing care. code <laughs> Dude, it's the internet. You'll always get in trouble. You'll always make somebody angry. It's just the way of life. Um, I don't know. I don't feel like that's that's like a terrible thing to just be open about. Like, yeah. No, 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 not at all. Why, and I, I don't think it's that controversial. World, but it, it is funny that there's like where like you you 
have to have money to survive. You know, I don't need a lot to live. I I live a very uh really like a very normal lifestyle. Um but like like yeah, dude, you can you can if you get good at this, if you become proficient and you can become like really good at certain things, you can become very valuable. And I'm into that. It's like hell yeah, it's challenging. It's fun. It's cool as shit once you start learning how to make stuff. Like, dude, once you realize what like learning how to do this, you can make anything that you can yep. imagine. You can just literally make anything. It's like that that starts to get into your brain. If you're a creative type person, you're like, wait, hold on a second. You're telling me I can spend a year and a half and just like put my fucking nose down. And then at the end of it, I can create literally anything I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do that. You know what I mean? And and if I get good at it people are going to pay me like stupid amounts of money to do it. It's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At that point, it seems like a no brainer, but, um, but th that's what it seems like. But, but people don't do it because work is the part that you cannot shortcut. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to do it. You have to learn it. And that part you have to do, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that is the thing that I think separates a lot of people is how much are you willing to sacrifice from your everyday life to learn how to do this new thing? I'm willing to sacrifice literally everything. But everything. I, I, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to socialize with people. It's none of that is important to me versus like achieving my goal. You know, that just trumps everything completely and just makes every single other thing completely meaningless to me. That's my superpower because I can do that. <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, hey, that's that's ambition, that's drive, but it speaks to that resilience and tenacity that I was talking about too. That's such a good indicator of success in tech because it's just you're gonna go through a series of walls, and I describe I'll describe it to my team is you know there's always a wall you have to get through, and you just have to bash your head against the wall until the bricks start moving a little bit, you know, and you find that weak spot where you make your way through, or you figure out the way to dig under it, or whatever it is. But I always draw analogies to like hurting yourself, smashing your head through a wall. But that is sort of what it feels like. But I always talk about how when you do the process of getting through that wall, you will always know exactly how to get through that wall again. And yep. all of the ways to shortcut that long, arduous process of just using your body to break through that barrier, whatever it is, it's going to shape your brain so much more and it makes such an impact when you solve that thing for the first time or when you get that thing live for the first time, you Mysterious know, that's organism, where things dude. click. Yep. Mysterious, Mysterious or organism. That, that was that. Exactly. That happened and I was like, <laughs> oh, really? Oh, oh wait, what? <laughs> I love it. And the creative side too. I've always liked the mentality that code is a craft, right? Early days you know, IBM and Microsoft and stuff, there's a lot of focus on code as engineering, like another engineering line or another assembly line, you know, type of thing. And you focus on lines of code. And then, you know, you saw a lot of it probably with Ruby world because Ruby world and, and other languages as well have had a lot more of a like, you know, this is a creative effort. Coding is a creative effort. I think in 2022, you know, everybody mostly agrees there's so much of a creative process involved and how you do code, how you develop things, how you build technology has so much, you know, creativity has so much impact and influence on it. So I love seeing that connection with musicians as well. And again, like we've had conversations on Twitter, there's lots of musicians, you know, in tech and software development. And I love seeing yeah, the creative that's success. Thing. That's an interesting thing. I, I definitely personally am like, yeah, the parallels are wild. Uh, creative coding and making music there's at least in the way that your brain is functioning there's not a big difference man like the way that you approach those issues i i i don't know that they would be very different you know your and any like harmonic problems or like after the music is made and been recorded like mixing issues just balancing things all of the, all of that <laughs> stuff is not it's not different it, like you're 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 just doing the same type of thing on a different canvas, you know, with a different kind of that. uh with a different like set of medium media. What's it called? Media. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, like art terms. What is it? Media is <laughs> plural. Medium yeah, yeah. is one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, I I just ranting now. I'm like a little bit. 
No, I love coffee. it. Well, I got you on the coffee, so yeah, I don't blame you. That was <laughs> I tricked you into caffeinating. No, no, it's good because the truth <laughs> is, is like on Code Academy, it's actually great. I'm gonna tell you why. Um, let me pull it up here. Yes, this one. On Code Academy, I'm doing intro to Redux Toolkit. Nice. To Ooh, Redux Toolkit is a. Uh... Is that what has RTK query or is that a different? Yeah, RTK. Know. Yeah, Redux We're about Toolkit. To find out. Um, <laughs> I'm about to that's learn. That's some good learning. Yeah, that's definitely you the know, more I, complex side of React stuff. Just all the state management things in React, I feel like it's interesting a lot because, of like, mental this, model. You say that this is more complicated, but once I learned, what do they call it? Uh, flux flow? Yeah, the flux called? architecture. Flux architecture. It's like that idea of like state view action repeat like that single direction of data flow <laughs> that makes a lot more sense to me than like normal react state management <laughs> well and that's... having a place having a store where you are you know initializing state and then using uh what do they call it the provider component yes. to wrap yeah, your yeah. app yep. and then having access so because like i didn't understand what prop drilling was until we started learning about this and then you're like oh that's super lame like that's why it's so confusing is because you have to like, <laughs> remember this pathway it's like did it fucking connect properly back to app and you're right. like that's so dumb like just yep. wrap it in provider store equals store and you're fucking cooking you do like let's go you know what I, mean? <laughs> I love it all right well i'm looking forward to hearing about your thoughts on uh redux toolkit and then that also gives me an idea maybe it, when we do get time to do an hour of pair coding i can we can talk about another state manager library because there's another one that i'd want to maybe well, you know test what's interesting with you as soon as i mentioned that i was learning this a bunch of people hit me in my dms and they were like do not learn redux but uh theo had said something to me that i thought was good advice he said the the tech doesn't matter so much right now. Learn the techniques. Learn learn what the point of the tech is, he said, and then yep. you're going to figure out which one is right for you to use later. He said Redux is fine. <laughs> yep. And that's exactly what I, I would give the same advice because when you talked about that, it's like, is you know Redux Toolkit what I would pick today? No, not necessarily. But again, you're going to learn the basic stuff. And just like you've already talked about, even like what you learned from Flow Architecture, like, you'll have similar light bulb moments where you're going to be learning about the architecture and the way the thing happens with that framework. And so much of the JavaScript ecosystem, even though they've evolved things, they've built new techniques and new APIs and ways of doing it. So it's many all based of them on that take, core principle. Yeah, and so many of them take inspiration from previous generations too. Like you'll hear people describe tons of things in 2022 as like, oh yeah, that was something that started with Ember. Like Ember started doing that or they took that idea from Ember and nobody uses Ember anymore really to start a new project, but you can still see that like, you know, lineage in a sense. And so even with smaller frameworks and tools, I think there's times where like everybody's kind of worked with React Query at some point, for instance, so like you're going to understand certain things about how React Query works. And there's even other frameworks and tools that will react that will wrap React Query or mimic the API. So like, oh, if you use React Query, use this thing the exact same way that you're already using React Query. So you do build a lot more shared understanding, I think, even if you go to use totally different tech in the future. Um, As I'm going, uh, and I'm just like naturally falling into new things. And the funny thing about like the YouTube algorithm as well is it's you can track my progress by what the algorithm is throwing to me because as i'm i mean it's crazy dude like it's absolutely wild because like as i'm searching for different oh, things youtube algorithms like oh you're th you're there now here we go here's uh here's uh jack harrington <laughs> like now you're at the jack harrington level of youtube videos <laughs> you're like youtube i can't keep up with how how quickly you think my alg your, your algorithm Yo, thinks hey, i'm the learning the algorithm is good though the algorithm is good because that's awesome it's because it got you the videos that i need to see <laughs> It's, they've been helpful you know what i mean <laughs> oh i love that yeah no i it is wild how much youtube has become like one of my top learning resources for like staying on top of you know being a software developer um i've always gone to youtube for certain things mainly for conference talks but like in the last year with you know people we've talked about jack harrington theo primogen 
Um, it is crazy how like high quality the educational content on YouTube is at this point. It really is wild. Oh, if you are motivated, like you said, if you're a, a, an organized self-starter and you are the type of person that doesn't need anybody to tell you what to do that day, you can definitely attain a, a university degree level of knowledge without spending a single penny. Oh, yeah. For sure. And you can do that in half the time if you're willing to do the work. It's it's just the information is just there. People should definitely not sleep on the idea. Like, the idea that this information is going to be free forever, I think, is a myth. You know? Hmm. I, I think that eventually people who really own the pathways that we all learn from that they're eventually going to just close that off behind paywalls and if you want to like learn stuff like everything's going to cost more you know what i'm saying it's like there's just too much money to be made from the amount of data that's being transferred and they're just it's just not going to be free forever i just don't believe it i I mean it's already kind of not free because if you're watching YouTube, you're either paying for YouTube premium or you're watching ads every other video at least, you know? So in a sense, yeah. you, you, we'll see. You know. Or maybe it's going to be the exact opposite. It's going to just become more free, but I don't know. I just feel like as soon as people figure out how to control something, they just do. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm gonna go. I should, uh, yeah, no. Well, I was going to say real quick, we never really asked, but I was going to say um, if there's any questions in chat, we've got seven people hanging out with us right now. So scrolling oh, shit. back, um, there was Count Torin like a while ago, but he, he asked, how are you comparing music to coding? Which we kind of got into there. I feel like that question, you know, we talked about the creative connection there. Um, and Croucher the, the said dip, super the... inspiring journey. So. The the connection is really not so much on the surface level. I think it's more on like the like in like the subconscious creative mind. You know what I'm saying? Like the way that you approach the process of making something with code, you have to have an idea first. Okay, like the code exists just as a set of tools to make the thing tangible right so the same thing is with music like you have an idea and then you have instruments that you're going to use to extract that and bring it into the ether it's really the same thing so it's not so much surface level that music and coding are the same it's that the way that you approach solving the problem of idea exists but idea is not here right we have to use the tools to make the idea exist. <laughs> yep. That's the process. That's very similar to me. Um, hmm. Yeah. This person asked, what kind of music did I make? Uh, rock and roll, baby. Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> Good old fashioned rock and roll, baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm That's... looking forward to it. Like, let's do the weekly thing, like you said, and I will. Uh... It's actually hard to time manage right now because um, Code Academy is its own thing that takes a lot of time. I have my little side projects that I want to work on because I know it's important to keep just writing code and like not not following tutorials. You know what I mean? Uh, but then there's also TypeScript, which I'm forcing myself to learn because they are writing everything in TypeScript. And he was like, look, I can, I can, and he said, I'm happy to guide you as we go. The more you learn before we start is going to be better. So of course I'm now doing a full TypeScript tutorial on Codecademy because they have like a 10, 12 hour course on there. Um, Yeah. TypeScript is a good one. You'll find a lot of people around here that like TypeScript. Oh no, no. TypeScript (laughs) is, uh, I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, it's, 100% 100% mandatory because once you start well he got you set up for using all the winters it, and everything too huh so you've got all your yeah. configs set up and and it's just like it starts to give you the solutions for you like it's telling you what to what it's expecting I uh I so see the power of TypeScript very quickly yeah yeah so next did link by the way total typescript.com this is, a, a, I was about to call him a friend, but I don't think I've ever actually met or talked to him. But Matt Pocock is one of the smartest 
TypeScript people ever. And he's built some really good resources and actually just quit his job to go full time on making learning resources for TypeScript. But I definitely bookmark right that link. Yeah, because his oh, well. tutorial is fantastic. Um, and I can shoot you, I'll DM you later a couple different links as well if you're curious. But yeah, TypeScript is tough because it's a lot to learn. I mean, it's like all things in tech, right? It gets very deep and there's a lot you can do with it. Um, but it's also one of the pieces where you really don't need, you can do a lot with a little. So if you're yeah. building React components, you can learn like 8 to 12% of TypeScript that's going to cover you for like 90% of what you'll ex experience in your day to day. And that's the cool mm -hmm. thing is if you can, if you can kind of dial in that, you know, little sliver that's going to help you do exactly what you need to do and not run into issues, you will become a better programmer by implementing that because it'll protect you from a lot of things and it'll teach you about the type system and how to consider the types of data in your application. Um, I'm into it. I'm into it. It's, I, 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 I'm it's good fun stuff. learning it. It's cool. It's yeah. cool. And also like this is, uh, I don't know if this is one of those types of things that people make fun of you for, but like code looks cool to me. <laughs> Like, like, I don't know if that's like cheesy or not, but like no, the way no, that code know. looks on the editor, like code looks cool and TypeScript makes it look even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is an opinion that not everybody would share with you. There are some people that hate TypeScript. There are some people that are like, oh, it's disgusting. You have to add all these types. And they like some would describe that as the worst part of it. But uh, no, I like it. I like I like TypeScript. All right, well, I, I got to run here. You should get to sleep or continue learning. I'm not going to sleep, but I'm going to be up for the next so, two hours coding. <laughs> yeah, next I'll just said TS is so ugly. Wait till you've seen Elixir. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's... Oh, you I mean, know what's again, ugly? Beauty is, is in the eye of the beholder, Check right? Tailwind is ugly. <laughs> Tailwind is ugly because once you start getting into, like, making things really specific, those class components they start taking up a lot of space and that can look very cluttered. Okay. That can look like, if you don't know what you're looking at there, you're like, what in the hell am I looking at right now? And then it starts to make sense, of course, like, and there's like a way that you lay it and it makes, you know, it's like structured. Right. But like, right. to me, that makes like CSS classes with a separate file, like writing in SAT, like SCSS or something like that. Like that's much nicer looking. <laughs> Then Tailwind, oh, yeah. but Tailwind is the way, dude. Oh, Tailwind is the, the religion way. of CSS. I love it. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right, well, all right. All right. Well, thank you so much for the time, Tomo. You have a wonderful night. We will talk yeah, man, again you soon. All right. Okay. See ya. Bye, everybody. Peace. All right. Um, I'm going to come over here. So that was awesome. Thank you, everybody who joined. Thank you. Huge shout out to Tomo as well. You can find him on Twitch. Um, and on Twitter, I made a, I made a command for him. I don't think anybody used it, but there's his, uh, thing on Twitter. So that was, if you don't know, um, I will link Nexel. Let me put on some music. I felt like it, I felt like having no music was deafening silence, but I'm used to having music while I stream. Thank you so much, Tomo, for stopping by. That was a really, really awesome time. And again, I'm excited to kind of follow along with you on this journey and help i'm hoping that i can fill in the gaps too and you hit like certain you know learning barriers or certain things that you're struggling with um i think it'd be cool to help out and from my perspective i mean my ultimate goal is to help create good educational content so if you're struggling learning something we could take your struggle and turn it into an educational video and then that helps you learn through it and we could you know help others learn through it as well so um Let's do it again in five seconds. <laughs> I'm going to go and spend a little bit of time with the wife tonight. So I was just going to say, I did forget completely about ads. So I didn't run any ads for most of that time. Um, and I was debating like playing a game, but I honestly think I'm just going to go and relax and rest the eyes for a bit. Um, but yeah, this was, this was a really good time. Yeah. Thank you again, Tomo. Thank you. Anybody, anybody who came from Tomo's community, um, Tig said, I think here is from Tomo's community. So 
yeah thank you guys for showing up thank you for sharing in this and i will i'm probably gonna try my hand at clipping up a little bit of our conversation too so i'll try making some videos that are you know clipped up segments just to make it a, a quick thing people can catch up on but yeah thank you all for hanging out i hope everyone has a wonderful night i will find somebody quickly to to uh raid so warning this will probably be somebody doing um actually you know what tonight we're gonna same raid... amount as mine we're gonna raid uh irl streamer again because there's no software people on wait a second yeah there's like okay interesting so I'm going to host this guy I met at TwitchCon. We're going to raid him. He is an IRL streamer. Not raiding Amarad. Um, but yeah, he is IRL streaming in Japan right now. So if you're interested in learning about food, if you're interested in... Um, yeah, and IRL streamers just kind of traveling and learning about the world. Um, I believe he's in Japan currently. So really fun stuff there but yeah we're gonna shoot him a raid to say hi and uh, we got nine people here thank you so much for hanging out um <laughs> there's i eat your ice cream coming in with the nate emotes i do have to make a couple more nate emotes that's a good one what are the other ones <laughs> all right guys take it easy tell dandelion verse i said hi <laughs>